Isaiah 58. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay because we got Bibles here. Isaiah 58. And looking past Easter Sunday, looking past Resurrection Weekend, summer's, summer's bearing down on us. And I'm as disturbed as that by that as you are. But um, the last few summers we've done, well, we've done some different things. I think a couple summers Rob has taught. I think one summer we dropped down of a verse-by-verse study and, and, and we just did a topical on Israel, if I recall. I think Pastor James taught um, through the summer, one summer. Any, all I wish to say, I don't know what, what the Lord has for us quite yet for this summer. Um, there's part of me that would really like to have Pastor Rob take midweeks for a couple months. I also know that he's got, I think, 71 kids in his home. It's hard to tell. They don't stop moving. Uh, so we'll see what the Lord has. But would, would, would you pray that the Lord would give us wisdom on that? We're tracking to finish Isaiah up probably right at the beginning of summer, um, chapter 58 tonight, so we're probably wrapping up at the end of May. I don't know, I'd like to do something before barreling ahead right into Jeremiah, so, so maybe, and, and this is something that, I, that I'm praying about, maybe we do a summer in Psalms. I have friends who do that, and... and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an idea to, to either take one of the books of Psalms, there are five, um, or to take a type of Psalm. And take a couple months and, and just dig deep into it, and then maybe start Jeremiah in the fall. I don't know. And because I don't know, that's a good place to be, because then the Lord can speak to us. It's harder for the Lord to speak when we think we know things. Isaiah 58. I think I know that. The last section of the book of Isaiah. And, and really, it's the last subsection of the book of Isaiah, because that the second big section began with chapter 40. And as we began this section, we noted in chapter 40, verse 2, you don't have to turn there, we've read it a bunch of times. Chapter 40, verse 2, God says, speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she's received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And we've noted a few different times that that's really an outline of this last section of Isaiah. This section that begins in chapter 40 and runs to the end. Her warfare accomplished, that was the theme of chapters 40 to 48. Her iniquity pardoned was the theme of chapters 49 to 57. Tonight, we begin a section that deals with Israel receiving double for her sins. Double because Israel is God's firstborn. And when we were in chapter 40, we explored um, how God calls her that and why. And as firstborn, we know the firstborn is doubly blessed. The firstborn inherits twice as much, but also God holds Israel twice as accountable. So tonight and next week, chapters 58 and 59, we get into God holding Israel accountable for her sins. And, and, and I, as I say that, we have to say again, holding Israel accountable for her sins again. It's another accounting. It's not remotely the first time that God has held a mirror up to Israel. But the Holy Spirit wants us to consider these things again, wants us along with Israel to examine their sins again. And so he calls on Isaiah, chapter 58, verse 1, to cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, shout, Isaiah, loud, use your outdoor voice. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. If he's telling Isaiah to shout this, this has got to be big. This has got to be important. Their sin must be big and significant. And right away we suspect we know what we're going to read because Jesus uses his loudest voice 
and his harshest verbiage to denounce what? Hypocrisy. And sure enough, verse 2, Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. Yet, this is, this is one of those times where, where the Hebrew thought is backward. You and I put the yet in the middle of a sentence. You know, the Vikings play really, really well Sunday over Sunday, yet they never win big games. We, we put the disclaimer in the middle, oftentimes, as Hebrews brought over to English, that yet is in the beginning. Yet, they seek me daily. So there's something wrong. There's something amiss. But they still seek me daily, says God. They're still worshiping or, or going through the motions of worship as if nothing is wrong. It's business as usual, from the outside at least. They seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God, as if they did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching God, approaching in the sense of public worship. They go through all the pomp and circumstance, all of the rites and the rituals. But the word delight there. The fact that it's repeated twice, and the fact that verse 2 began the way that it did with the word yet, we know that this is sarcasm. They're acting, Israel is acting as if everything is okay between them and God. And maybe they even believe it, because they're doing, God says, the right things. The worshipy things, the ordinances and the feasts and the sacrifices. And verse 3, the fasts. Oh, they love their fasts. Verse 3, why have we fasted, they say, and you've not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? It, you, you might have heard. It, it gets bandied about. People, people talk about fasting and, and they say things with authority that aren't actually true. Have you ever heard somebody say, you know, nowhere in the Bible are we told to fast? Well, be careful. There, it's true, there is no instruction in the New Testament, there's no instruction to the church to fast. On the other hand, there's an assumption Jesus and the apostles writing the epistles talk as if they assume that we'll fast. So that's one of those things, okay, be careful. Is there an edict? Is there a commandment? No. Is there an assumption? There is. And there is a commandment to Israel. We find it in Leviticus 23, certain fasts for certain times. We know also by the time of Jesus that they, the, Israel's leadership had added other fasts to what the law required. They'd added other fasts and, and they added to, to the existing fasts additional requirements. They made them more stringent. Certain hours, certain days with the idea, well, if a little is good, a lot must be better. Whether that was true in Isaiah's time yet or not, we're not sure. When, when, when verse 3, the, the fasting that the Holy Spirit is speaking about through Isaiah, were those the required fasts or were those add-on fasts? We suspect that perhaps they were add-on but whatever fasting they were doing, it almost doesn't matter because God just said, you're missing the point. Because you're asking me, God says, why have we fasted and you haven't seen? God, why have we afflicted our souls? We have fasted and we fasted for hours and days and you take no notice. We're fasting, God, and we're not getting anything back from you. We're fasting and you're not blessing we're fasting, and why aren't you rewarding with, we don't know, crops, abundant crops, some, some kind of financial prosperity, military victory, we're not sure. But they were expecting something as a quid pro quo for their fasting. And we can tell from the Holy Spirit's tone, it's not approving, is it? We haven't even gotten to the rebuke yet, and, and we can tell where this is going because we know 
quid pro quo, giving in order to get, that's never the point of fasting. And, and, and that's, that's another thing that, that as the church we can sometimes be confused about. As a young believer, I was really confused about that. Because when I, when I wanted something, when I needed something, when, when I wanted to ask something of God, I'd pray. But when it was really important, when it was big, well, then I'd fast and pray. Because, because fasting is a way you know, to put a little extra juice on that prayer. God's more likely to answer my prayer if I fast and pray. And that's completely unbiblical. That's sort of a distortion of, of Jesus telling the disciples, well, this one only comes out by prayer and fasting. Oh, okay. So if I, if I really want God to hear my prayer, I better juice it up with, with some fasting. No. That's, that's, that's never the teaching of Scripture. The point of fasting, and, and, and the, the point of prayer for that matter, is never to compel God or induce God to respond a certain way. The point of prayer and the point of fasting is always to draw close to God. And Israel's leaders, back to our text, were not interested in drawing close to God, which God knows. Still verse 3. Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice, you ask? Well, because the thing of it is, is in, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your labors. Pleasure, another translation, could be business. You, you carry on your, your, your business, you're taking care of yourself, you're pursuing your own self-interests. You're not seeking, not really. You're not praying, not truly. You're not meditating on the truth of my word, not deeply. You're just sitting back and expecting, and meanwhile, going on with business as usual. And the results are predictable. Verse 4, indeed you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will, <laughs> you will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on a high. We can tell they're not focused on God because the Holy Spirit just said, when you fast, you get cranky. That's how I know that, that your fasting is superficial. It's to get something. It's not about relationship. It's, it's ritualistic. When you fast, you get cranky. You end up griping. You end up brawling. You end up swinging on each other. So you're, you're clearly not more sensitive to my word or to my spirit. You're just more cantankerous in your flesh, which is always the result when we deprive our flesh in our flesh. We call that white knuckling sometimes. I'm going to quit this. I'm going to start this. I'm going I'm to undertake this spiritual discipline. Or I'm going to set aside this, this habit, this sinful practice. When we do that in the flesh, when we, when we try to master the flesh with our flesh, our flesh gets mad, and that expresses itself in short-temperedness, in meanness, in frustration. Yeah, you're doing the wrong thing the wrong way, says God. Verse 5, he, he points that out. Is it a fast that I've chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this what I'm looking for? And, and when God asks a question like this, we understand that it's rhetorical, right? He's not really asking. He's asking a question for the purpose of pointing something out. You're trying to compel God, the Holy Spirit says. And the way I know is that you're all frustrated when you're doing it. Pause. Another way to look at these verses, another way that some commentators understand them and interpret them, is verse 4 is, is an, uh, God is saying, you're, you're just trying to distract me. You don't want me to look at your fighting and your strife and your brawling and, and your flesh. 
So look at our fast over here. Don't, don't look at what's over here. Look at the good thing that we're doing over here. Like one time I remember I, I made my mom breakfast in bed and I had never done this before, but I brought the tray in because you know, I'd seen people do it on TV and stuff. So you know, I made some toast and some juice and whatever and I brought it in and I woke her up. She, she woke up, she looked at me, she looked at the tray of breakfast and she said, what did you break? And, and so that's, that's another possible way of reading this, is, is God saying, you know that you're sinful, you know that you're, you're, you're full of strife and anger, and you expect me to not see it, because, oh, you know, you're giving me this, this fast, this, this gesture of, of piety, piety over, over here. Either way, whatever their heart, it's not what God is looking for. It's not what God wants, it's not what he asks for, it's not what he expects. What he expects, what he wants, what he wanted and what he wants, because we just sang a, a few minutes ago that, that God is the same God today as he was then. Is this not the fast that I've chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? And that when you bring your, to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked, that you cover them and not hide yourself from your own flesh. What, what God is saying is, if, you're, if you want to fast in a way that pleases me, why not pay attention to the things that I've told you? How about fast? Here's an idea. How about fast from sin? How about take a break from evil and wickedness, from hurting other people and oppressing those who are less fortunate? This time of year, we think about Lent and, and, and you know, the religious tradition some of us grew up in. Fasting for meat on Fridays. It used to be a more aggressive fast on Fridays, and then they toned it down. Now it's just fasting for meat on Fridays. And... and, and you know, in some traditions, people are, are encouraged, well, give up, give up something for the 40 days of Lent. Give up chocolate, give up soda. Or, or, you know, in the modern world, give up TV, give up social media. God is saying, yeah, how about give up things that I've already said I hate? <laughs> you know, what, what, what does it profit you to give up chocolate and, and Coca-Cola while you're still sinning sins? What, what good does it do to give up meat on Fridays when you're still oppressing the poor, when you're not helping actually feed anyone? Maybe change that, God is saying. Maybe start there. Deny yourself, okay, but use whatever you're foregoing to bless someone in need. What Israel was doing was ritual at best. And and. And maybe it, may, it might not even be fair to call it ritual because it wasn't ritual in the sense that, that God in, in the Old Testament prescribed certain rituals, certain rites, certain ordinances and observances for Israel. God is saying it, 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 it's not that. There's at least a suggestion that, that at least some of what was going on was their idea. Hey, God, we made up this ritual to honor you. So now you have to bless us, because not only are we doing the ritual, but we, we invented the ritual, so we should be twice blessed. And God says, no, honor me by understanding me. Honor me by emulating me. Do as I do. Honor me, worship me by sharing my heart for the poor, for the orphan, for the widow. Worship me by loving others. As New Testament Christians, we tend to think, here's another thing that we get only half right, we tend to think of that as a New Testament idea, as a Jesus teaching. And it is, obviously. But the first place that that idea appears in Scripture? Leviticus 19.18. Ten more than 10 years ago, um, President Obama was still in office, and a, a journalist finally 
pinned him down or he decided that he was ready to get pinned down on the subject of same-sex marriage. And his response was, well, I just, I just think we ought to follow the golden rule. And I preached a sermon the next week pointing out that the golden rule was in Leviticus that also has some other things to say on the subject of same-sex marriage. Worship me not with empty rituals. Do away with this, this, this form without function. Wor no, worship by sharing my heart, God says. Worship by loving, verse 8. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You'll cry and he'll say, here I am. You want God to hear your prayers? Start there. Do that. I, backing up for just a second, I missed pointing something out that I meant to. Did you notice back in verse 6 an echo of what Jesus says in Matthew 6? When Jesus talks about fasting, what does he say? He says, don't be all, all bummed out. Don't walk around, walk around with a hangdog expression, sort of inviting people. Hey, what's wrong with you? Oh, I'm fasting. Because we can do that, right? We can carry ourselves in a way that sort of begs the question. What's wrong with you? I'm fasting. Can't you see how spiritual I am? I've been fasting for three days now. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast for four more. You, you know what the best way to do a three-day fast, by the way, is? Start a seven-day fast. <clears throat> but Jesus says, Jesus says, don't call attention to yourself. If you're fasting, the purpose of fasting is to draw close to the Lord. So do that. And if you're doing that, what should be the fruit of that? What should be the result of drawing close to the Lord? In his presence is fullness of joy, I thought. So, so lightness, cheerfulness, revival, even, even as we're depriving our physical frame, our spirit should be uplifted. And, and that's not what Israel is doing, is, is the point. At least not its leaders, but you know, as, as the priests go, so go the people. God is saying, you're not worshiping me. You're not seeking me. You're not serving me. How do I know? You're not loving people in my name. You're just, just doing all of this ritual stuff and that's why i seem far away god says to israel that's why i seem far away god says to calvary chapel because it's the same principle for us same god are we reading you know many of many of us you know undertake the the, the spiritual discipline well i'm going to be in my bible i'm going to read every day okay are you reading to check a box that said that you read today? Or are you reading to hear from God in the living word? God who knows what your day is going to bring. Are, are, are you reading to have real fellowship with the redeemer of your soul? I pray every day. Okay, are you praying a laundry list of wishes, wants, and desires? And, and I mean, and, and many of them might be good, might be for others. And, and, and we get to pray for ourselves. Give us this day our daily bread. But are we stopping there? Is that where we start and stop with prayer? Or is our prayer fellowship? Fellowship with the God who is our Father, who loves us, who desires, yes, to, to give good things for his children. He doesn't want that to be the sum of our relationship. Part of it, sure. Fathers love to do things for their children. I'm a dad, I know. But I'd get really bummed out if that were the, 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 the sum total of my relationship with my daughter. Are we, are, are we praying to, to ask or are we praying to relate? We talked Sunday. What's our attitude coming, coming here on a Sunday morning, on a Wednesday night? Are we coming here to serve or be served? It's, it's okay if it's both. But if we're coming here as consumers, I hope that Patrick brings his A-game today. I hope it's the worship leader that I like doing the songs that I like. 
if, if, if we're coming here as consumers, we've missed it. And, 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 and when we serve, how do we serve? Do we serve with, with an overflow of the spirit that, that dwells in us? Is, is our service spiritual or is it carnal? Is it, is, it, is it the thing that we do to find identity? Are, are we doing penance in our service? Are we, are we finding validation in our service? Or are, are we pouring out the spirit of the living God in our service? Point is, we can be doing a lot of Jesus things. Israel was, was doing a God thing. Fasting is, is one of the ordinances, one of the instructions God gave them in Leviticus. And, and, and so too, we can be doing a lot of Jesus stuff, but pushing God away in the process. If it's not done according to his heart, if it's not done in pursuit of his heart and as an overflow of his heart, how different it is, back to our text, how different it is, the Holy Spirit says, when worship is genuine. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer, verse 9. You'll cry, he'll say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, isn't it interesting, as Jesus says, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. If you take away the burden, the Holy Spirit is saying, and the accusation, the pointing of the finger and the speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, if you, if, you, if you stop making it what you've made it and get back to the heart of worship, three things are going to happen. Three things are going to happen, the Holy Spirit says. Your light shall dawn in the darkness. Your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You'll be like a watered garden. And not a, uh, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundation of many generations and shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorers of streets to dwell in. Three things there. Reputation. You'll speak of me. You'll speak of the true and living God and people will see me. Provision. I'll meet your needs, and then some. Restoration. And obviously this is, this is millennial, and it's in, in our interpretation of it. This is millennial in view. This is the physical restoration of Israel. But is there a spiritual application? Of course there is. When we repent of religion, when we repent of reading for the sake of reading, praying to serve ourselves, serving that's selfishness in disguise, God will also glorify himself in us, supply us, use us. Same goes for the Sabbath. Time's getting away from us which is fortunate because there's only two verses devoted to this. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure in my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor following your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And he'll cause you to rise on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So, so follow this. God starts talking about religion in general. You're, you're approaching me in worship, but it's not really worship, and I think we both know that. that that's, that's how the chapter started out. And then he narrowed it to a for instance, kind of like Paul on Sunday. Okay, we've gone big picture. Let's talk about a specific for instance. He talked about fasting. Now he's back to the original point. What was the original point? To obey is, to better than, is better than sacrifice. You made up a bunch of rules and followed them when it comes to fasting while ignoring the stuff that I really care about. And here you go again, you're doing it with the Sabbath. So this is another example of that general principle that the Lord gave us at the beginning of the chapter. Verse 13. Yeah, I, 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 I ordained a Sabbath, but what have you done with it? This, the Sabbath is always a, a, a pretty good barometer of Israel's spiritual health at any given time, right? Because 
Israel tends, in, throughout their history, tends towards one of two extremes. Either they ignore the Sabbath, or they add lots of rules and regulations to it. Remember in Jesus' day, they were forever trying to, to trap Jesus when? On the Sabbath. Look at what your disciples are doing on the Sabbath. You just healed on the Sabbath. And, and both extremes miss the point. What's the point? Verse 14. What is always the point? What are we always to do? Delight ourselves in the Lord. It's always about drawing close to God. Again, there's a millennial fulfillment here. Right on high hills points probably to a dual meeting of, of political leadership and, and spiritual closeness. Jesus will be ruling and reigning over the world from Israel. So there will be spiritual closeness and political leadership both for Israel when, when they get this right. Heritage of Jacob, they'll possess the fullness of the land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for the first time ever. So the, the interpretation is millennial. But what about for us as we wrap up tonight? Physical fulfillment in the millennium, what's the spiritual fulfillment today? And this is one that people get touchy about. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Don't be talking about the Sabbath. This is church. Okay, but, but well, <laughs> breathe. Again, what's the message of the chapter? Holy Spirit is saying, stop gripping the law. Presence of the law, absence of the law. What's behind the law? The heart. Jesus said the Sabbath is made for men, not men for the Sabbath. The purpose of the Sabbath was always to bless humanity and not to burden us. So too with tithing, so too with serving, so too with fasting, so too with dietary laws. All intended to be blessings. And those that carry over to you and me in the, in the church are likewise the heart of God for his people, giving our, 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 our New Testament Christians required to tithe. We can debate that all day. I think it's a get to and not a got to. Are we commanded to fast? We're not. But we get to and thereby draw close to God. Again and again and again, there's not a commandment. There's just an assumption. Why wouldn't we? And, and, and so when it comes to the Sabbath, be careful that we don't religiously, and I use that word on purpose, be careful that we don't religiously avoid the idea of a Sabbath. No, what we get to do here as we wrap up, we're reminded we get to pursue a Sabbath that's really a Sabbath. A Sabbath that's not defined by a day of the week, and what we are or aren't allowed to do. You know, you go to Israel today, there are Sabbath elevators. You don't have to push buttons on them. They just stop at every floor. Why? Because on the Sabbath, you're not allowed to do work. And completing an electrical circuit, like pushing a button in an elevator, is work. A friend of mine tells a story about having a Jewish and observant uh, Jewish neighbor who, who came over to his house one day um, on, on, on Saturday, on the Sabbath, on the Jewish Sabbath, stood, stood on the porch, didn't ring the doorbell because completing an electrical circuit, couldn't knock because work. Finally, my, my friend notices that he's out there and he says, can, can I help you? And he says, I can't ask. And, and, he, and he turns and starts heading back to his house. My friend says, do you want me to follow you? And he says, I can't say yes. Follows him to his house and, and walks in, the vacuum cleaner is running. Apparently the dog had, had been running through the house, knocked over the vacuum cleaner, turned it on. But being observant Jews, on the Sabbath, they couldn't turn the vacuum off. <laughs> and he says, do you, do you want me to turn it off? And he says, I can't say please. <laughs> this, this is what the Sabbath is it, to, to, to a modern day 
observant Jew. And, and, and God is saying, oh, that the Sabbath would be truly the Sabbath. Not defined by, by, by rules and regulations, but, but a blessing from my heart. And the application here for us is that we would lay hold of a Sabbath that's not a day, and it's not a way, and it's not a set of rules, but is a delight. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Yes, and would that we would take time to appreciate that, to revel in that, and, and, and to worship God from that place of simply drawing close to his heart and appreciating the gift that he's given us. To obey is better than sacrifice, yes. What is obedience at the end of the day? Love God and love people in his name. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Israel for going before us and doing things that we do, being so very human that, that we could watch and we could learn and we could see ourselves and be corrected, be exhorted, be encouraged. Because as much as, as, much as they work very, very hard at getting it wrong, your love for them never runs out. Your mercy for them endures, and so too for us who work very, very hard at getting it wrong. Your love for us endures, and your mercy never runs out. We praise you for that this evening.